podcast is brought to you by LMU Munich. Okay, let me thank the organizers of this beautiful conference first. In this talk, I would like to present some exact, exact results concerning conf certain conformal interfaces between two dimensional conformal field theories related by a uh, renormalization group flow. Uh, I'll spend the, the first half of my talk presenting, giving a, a background for this question. Uh, explaining why, why is it interesting, what are the motivations for it. Now, uh, I should start with a, re reviewing a definition. Uh, a conformal defect in a conformal field theory is a, is a defect, an extended defect, which preserves as much conformal symmetry as you could reasonably expect. So, for example, a conformal boundary condition in a four-dimensional conformal field theory is a boundary condition which preserves all conformal transformations which fix the boundary. So in that case, the group, the subgroup of conformal transformations, or the four-dimensional group of conformal transformations, are conformal, dimension, conformal transformations in three dimensions. For a d-dimensional defect, you can hope to preserve the d-dimensional d-dimensional conformal group together, possibly with rotations around the defect. Now, um, if you if you're just given any a generic defect in a, in a conformal field theory, you can always try to get a conformal defect by just flowing to the infrared. After all, the bulk theory is just not going to change, and there is a good chance that in the infrared you'll find some defect which is scale invariant and possibly conformal invariant. But of course, uh, it's perfectly possible that in the process you'll just lose the defect, you'll get to something trivial. Now, in supersymmetric conformal field theories, conformal defects are sort of are ubiquitous. They're very relatively easy to construct and, and to describe. Um, there are many of them, and they're, and they're rather useful. In two-dimensional conformal field theory, conformal boundary conditions uh, are very well studied because we use them to make brains in string theory. Um, there are fewer known examples of conformal defects uh, in, in non-supersymmetric in general, non supersymmetric conformal field theories, but they seem to exist. Uh, for example, conformal boundary conditions for the 3D Ising model. Now, um, even just today, you're going to encounter several uh, instances of how conf conformal defects and defects can be powerful computational tools to determine the properties of the bulk theory. Uh, of course, this is definitely not a new, new idea. There have been uh, many, many applications in the past. But today, for example, you hear how surface defects in four-dimensional, n equal true four-dimensional gauge theories can be used to compute the superconformal index, even for theories without a Lagrangian. And you might hear, you'll hear about uh, the index of three-dimensional conformal field theories as well. You might hear that uh, line defects can be used to control the properties of this index. Now, uh, these examples make, make one wonder if, if and, I mean, how many other interesting applications of defects in conformal field theories are, are there waiting to be uncovered? Uh, and, uh, but there is sort of an, an obstacle in this, in this sort of approach, which is that while with local operators, we are familiar, we, we have this idea that local operators are an intrinsic property of the conformal field theory. They're always there. We can always use them to study it. Uh, for extended defects, the situation is a bit murkier. If you have a local operator, if you want to study the local operators of the conform conformal field theory, you can always do a state use a state operator map. So you know that there are as many operators as there are states of the theory in the sphere. But if you're trying to study an extended defect, that's less obvious. Uh, if you look at the problem, uh, in one way, it might, you might think that there are probably almost no conformal defects in a general conformal field theory. Uh, you might think that typically if you, if you take a defect, if you can even find a defect and you flow to the infrared, you'll just lose it. Uh, on the other hand, there are examples where you have way too many defects, in a sense. So say if you look at an equal 4 super mil and you think about conformal boundary conditions for an equal 4 super mils, if you take a pretty generic uh, three-dimensional conformal field theory, superconformal field theory, with a favorable symmetry that you can couple to the bulk gauge fields, you'll get a superconformal boundary condition. So sometimes you find as many boundary conditions as you have uh, field theories, and uh, you start wondering which, if any, 
are really teaching you something intrinsic about the bacteria. Uh, so somehow we, we should try to focus on defects which encode intrinsic properties of your theory and find ways to produce them in generic CFTs. Um, there are, uh, especially after the SCFT, there are good reasons to try to understand what are the properties of generic CFTs different from the ones that we are used to. For example, uh, when you study, we try to find holographic duals of pure gravity in anti-deciter space. One of the first constraints you try to put is that you don't have operators besides the ones that correspond to the graviton in the bulk. But you probably might wonder if you should put other constraints, such as not having operators which are dual to string, to dynamical strings or dynamical membranes in the bulk. So uh, it's, there, are, there are several motivations for trying to find a general strategy to identify defects in conformal field theories, identify conformal defects. Uh, now, actually, uh, there is a I mean, something that helps is that typically, if you're studying a conformal field theory, it sits at the bottom of some RG flow. That's usually how we define conformal field theories. And if you have an RG flow and you have some massive object in ultraviolet, some massive particle, a tension full string, a dynamic domain work, they would typically give you defects far in the infrared because they become infinitely massive. Their tension will go to infinity. Uh, of course, uh, you have no guarantee that this will be interesting defects, non-trivial defects, but at least it gives you a, a way to produce defects. Uh, and this uh, has been used in this work with, uh, with Rastelli and, and, uh, and Sean Razmat, for example, to produce surface defects in four-dimensional and equal true gauge theories. So in general, just the fact that you have an RG flow from some UV description to your infrared CFT give you a handle on defects in the infrared conformal field theory. Now, there is another source of inspiration, uh, which is the fact that, which is the fact that there is a particular def a defect that is particularly interesting in uh, supersymmetric conformal field theories, which are Janus domain walls. Janus domain walls interpolate between the same conformal field theory at different values of an ex exactly marginal coupling. Uh, they've occurred over and over in, in, in recent years in studying things from as the action of destuality on uh, on boundary conditions on equal force super mills to the study of all crossing of uh, BPS states in Michael Chu gauge theories. Um, and an interesting property they have is that they really define, give a, a very concrete realization of the map uh, of observables from the ultraviolet to the infrared. It's often literally true in supersymmetric cases you can take some, some ultraviolet object, bring it to the wall, and transform it into whatever infrared object. Uh, it will become under RG flow. Uh, or if you want, you can just take your Janus domain wall, wrap it on a, on a sphere in radical quantization, and then it will give you a map from the Hilbert space of states of the theory, a different value of the, of the couplings. Uh, and this map should be a, a full non-perturbative definition of the, uh, of the mixing matrix which takes the ultraviolet degrees of freedom, the ultraviolet Hilbert space. Sorry, not ultraviolet, which takes the value, the, degrees of freedom and Hilbert space, so the theory has some value of the couplings and remixes it into the Hilbert space or the theory has some different value of the couplings. Now, I said ultraviolet because um, in, in non-supersymmetric theories, exactly marginal couplings are rare, so maybe we should try to do the same with non-exactly uh, marginal couplings. So um, suppose that you have some, you're given some conformal, some uh, RG flow between two conformal field theories, in ultraviolet and infrared one. Assume that there is some operator that you can add to the ultraviolet CFT to start the RG flow. Now, I could take the same operator, put, but integrate it all, over, only on half of the space. Then, as, if you flow to the infrared, the theory will flow to the infrared CFT on half the space and remain the ultraviolet CFT on the other half. In between, you'll find some sort of interface. Uh, now, so this is a graphical depiction of this process. So you have some operator that could be added to the ultraviolet theory to produce the infrared theory. But if you only had it on half space and you float to the infrared, you're bound to find a, an interface between these two theories. 
And if you flow all the way to the infrared, this is probably going to be a conformal invariant interface. Now, I'm talking about the RG domain world, but uh, as, as it, it's not really true that just given two theories, an RG world flow between them, you can immediately produce an RG domain world. In the sense that when you break translation symmetry like this, uh, you have to include in your renormalization group flow possible counterterms which also break the translation symmetry, for example, the integral of some operators on the boundary. So in principle, there is still a certain amount of uh, work to do to figure out what is exactly the, what is a natural definition of energy flow in a generic theory. So it still requires a little bit of a case-by-case -case analysis. But uh, in general, intuitively, I would like to think about the RG domain world between two theories as something which uh, encodes the mixing of operators, quant objects. Uh, it describes how objects in ultraviolet field theory flow to objects in infrared field theory. And again, you can really literally try to use this RG domain wall, if you can define it, to map objects from the UV to the IR. So in radial quantization, you can wrap this domain wall on a sphere and get a map from the Hilbert space of the, uh, or from the, or the UV tier on the sphere to the Hilbert space of the, of the IR tier of the sphere. Or alternatively, a map from the operators in the UV theory to the operators in the IR theory. If you define your RG flow properly, you might hope that this map encodes the renormalization of UV operators into IR operators. Uh, if you think in terms of uh, conformal perturbation theory, uh, you, you usually take some operator of the UV theory and start integrating the, the perturbation over the rest of space, usually avoiding a little disk around your UV operator as a regulator. And then you try to send the regulator to zero and in the process you have to figure out how how to redefine the, your basis of operators to produce infrared operators or the infrared theory. So this RG domain world should hopefully encode exactly this mixing. Uh, if you want to be more precise, you can work in conformal perturbation theory. So you can consider an ultraviolet conformal field theory, which has a just very relevant operator with a property that the beta function has a zero, which is reachable perturbatively. And then uh, at the limit order, only, ultra, only operators in ultraviolet uh, of almost the same dimension will mix among themselves to produce infrared operators. And the mixing is, is essentially the matrix which diagonalizes the, the dilatation operator at the limit order. So if there's some way to construct your RG domain world, well, it should be true. At least you can conjecture that this domain world will reproduce this mixing matrix. So this is the conjecture which I would like to, uh, to test. The idea that RG domain worlds, if properly defined, can give a non-perturbative definition of how uh, operators in ultraviolet mix into operators in infrared. So just to make sure it's clear, the way you define this mixing matrix given the RG domain world is you put the operator say the origin is surrounded with a spherical RG domain world, and you read off which IR operator that is, say by putting an IR operator at infinity. Uh, the, the result of this correlation function will depend on the radius of the sphere only as a power law before, because of conformal invariance. And so you can just extract the coefficient of the power law. Now, uh, in order to test this conjecture, uh, I need a sort of calculable example where I can have a good hope to both compute the mixing matrices and find the actual RG domain world. Uh, the most favorable example is the RG flow between minimal models in two-dimensional conformal field theory, which has been very well studied by uh, Zamolojnik, it was really the canonical example of a perturbative uh, conformal, of conformal perturbation theory. Now, I would like to remark that in two dimensions, this conjecture is particularly strange. It's almost unbelievable. Because the, this pairing is nothing else but the boundary state which, is, which describes the conformal interface. 
Now, in two-dimensional conform field theory, boundary states satisfy very intricate uh, non-linear non relations due to modular invariance. Just, just the requirement that if you take this, this conformal interface and you uh, put it on a torus or you slap some, uh, some or you put it in the middle of a cylinder with some boundary conditions on the sides, you should get a, an integral spectrum of open string states propagating in the other channel. So modular invariance constraints, constraints strongly uh, boundary states and it's sort of crazy to think that this mixing matrix derived by diagonalizing the, the conformal perturbation theory dilatation operator should satisfy the same relations. So because it's counterintuitive is also interesting. So in, in the, the GIF, let me give you a few more details about the, the flow between minimal models. So this starts from, a, okay, as I said, it, it relates consecutive minimal models. Uh, minimal models in general are labeled by two integers, but I'm restricting to the unitary minimal models, which are labeled only by one integer p. This flow is perturbative uh, for large p. It's initiated by an operator, O13, whose dimension is, one, is roughly 1 minus 2 over p. So for large p, there's a chance for the flow to be uh, perturbative. It was verified by some logic that it is perturbative. And you reproduce things like the leading conformal dimension of the operators in the infrared uh, to conform perturbation theory. Now, remember that the operators in minimum models are uh, labeled by entries of a cut stable, so that they're labeled by two integers, R and S. One runs from uh, 1 to P, and the other from 1 to P plus 1. And uh, because of the uh, selection rules and correlation functions of minimum models, some logic observed that when you do conformal perturbation theory, only operators or descendants which sit in the same row of the cut stable will mix among themselves. And the result of the mixing would be the operators which sit in the same column of the cusp table of the infrared uh, minimal models. And he literally computed the dilatation operator for many of these operators. And it's very easy to take the expression of his paper and find the matrix that diagonalizes it. So you can compute the, the mixing matrices explicitly, the linear order in one of P uh, for many, many operators, for infinite classes of operators. Okay, so with that in hand, uh, we need to find the conformal interface, which could be a candidate for the RG domain work. Now, this is sort of tricky because uh, although the minimum models are rational conformal field theories, and although uh, you can use a reflection trait to transform a boundary condition, uh, sorry, a domain work, a conformal interface into a boundary condition in the product theory. Uh, the main tool that we have to build, uh, sorry, right. the main tool that we have to build theories in, uh, to build brains in rational conformal field theories is card deconstruction. But unfortunately, if you apply card deconstruction to the product of two theories, you typically take, get the product of two brains. So instead of finding a domain world which is almost transparent, is perturbatively close to just having nothing, you would have a domain world which is completely reflective. Now, uh, that's the reason for which there are actually very few known uh, conformal interfaces between rational conformal field theories. Uh, if you look at the literature, you find a few nice examples, very nice examples that are produced with a trick which we could call generalized orbit fold. So the idea is that you start with some other theory and with Cardi boundary conditions in that theory, which are completely uh, understood algebraically. And then you look for a topological interface between that theory and your product theory. If you can find one, you can slap the topological interface on the, on the boundary, and that is known to produce another conformal brain. As long as uh, you, the boundary condition and the topological interface are sufficiently interesting, uh, you can, find a bun you can find a boundary condition which, is, which gives a non-totally reflecting uh, domain world. So this is a general strategy which one might think of following, but how do you pick a candidate uh, theory? 
Now, if you look at the if you look at the cost of description of minimal models, say, uh, which is SU two k times SU two one over SU two k plus one for the UV one, and the same with k minus one one and k for the IR one. If you stare at the product theory for a bit, it's hard to resist the temptation to just cancel the common factors of SU two k. Now, uh, and, and think in terms of this concept. A uh, slightly more sane uh, motivation for this is that we know from zamological analysis that the only states that are paired up between the UV and IR are states which carry the same label. This labels a row of the UV cuts table and a column of the IR cuts table. This label R is literally related to a choice of representation for this SU2K. And so if you take a primary of this theory, it's actually closely related to the product of this, of this primaries. More precisely, the, this theory has a very large rational algebra. And you, you can decompose primaries of this rational algebra under these rational subalgebras. And then you find the sum over these verma modules of these primaries. So this is just a little bit more of a hint that maybe if you're lucky, you, you might be able to realize the RG domain world with the generalized orbit fold. Now, to have a solid argument, one can observe a hidden symmetry of the RG domain world. It turns out that the minimum models have a, a nice set of topological interfaces which commute with the perturbation. But if they commute to the perturbations, they really should commute, they, they should just be unable to see your RG domain world. More precisely, they should be able to, you should have a the topological interface of the UV theory should be able to go straight to the topological interface of the IR theory in a topological way, in such a way that you can deform this picture freely without caring about the RG domain world. This is actually a very strong constraint and pretty much almost forces the, the RG domain world to, to come from a generalized orbit for construction. And I don't have time to get the details, unfortunately, but uh, let's just say that you can, comp you can make this conjecture. You can look for an interesting boundary condition in this theory. Now, notice this theory has two SU21 factors, which means that there are interesting boundary conditions which permute them. And if you follow through with the, with the uh, exact form of the boundary states and of the topological interface within these two theories, you will discover that uh, if you take this sort of twisted boundary condition with the changes that you to choose, uh, it will give you an almost transparent domain world, which is what we are after. And so you start looking at possible shows of boundary condition, and it's very easy to find one that uh, is a reasonable candidate. So you take it, you compute explicitly the boundary state, and you compare it with the zoological calculation, and miraculously they agree. And it's, you know, this, there are a whole bunch of coefficients in the boundary states, complicated square roots of, uh, um, of rational functions of P. And they arise in completely different ways because in, on one side you are uh, diagonalizing the visitation operator, on the other side you are constructing this boundary state in an intricate way. And it's rather remarkable that they will agree. Uh, it's also worth saying that this method applies not just to the, to the RG flow between minimal models, but to a very general class of RG flows, which, are, which, is, uh, which involves these sort of corsets. Uh, incidentally, these are also the RG flows which produce integrable, integrable uh, two-dimensional theories along the RG flow, but I haven't been able to find any relation between that statement and, uh, and the existence of these domain walls of these RG domain walls and the properties of these RG domain walls. It's probably also worth pointing out that uh, these W minimum models that uh, you have heard about a few days ago in the context of uh, holography with Vasilev theory also belong to this class. So in principle, you could, you find yourself with uh, some interesting exact RG flows in the boundary theory, RG domain walls in boundary theory it might be worthwhile to explore uh, what do they mean in the band. Um, 
it's, uh, of course, the, all this is two-dimensional. You might wonder if, if it's possible to do some calculation in, uh, in modern two dimensions. And another motivation for this work was that uh, in, in the context of some work with uh, Tudor de Moft, uh, we encounter some three-dimensional theories which um, have properties which uh, pretty much agree with what we would expect to find for an RG domain world between uh, an ultraviolet and infrared description of a subvertent theory, say. So uh, I think RG, RG domain worlds might be exactly constructible, say, in any culture theories. Uh, maybe even any for one tiers, and it might be worthwhile to explore that. Okay. I'm ready for the question. Yo, uh, Davide. Are there questions? Yes. Uh, okay, so if quantum fields are displaying uh, complete information about everything in the universe, then what would constitute the defects? Are you saying that we have incomplete information about the behavior of quantum fields so that the part of the behavior we don't know about is what creates the defects? Or are you saying the defects are part of the uh, part of the discrete structure of space-time, and uh, it depends on a discrete model, you produce defects due to the discrete structure, or how would you explain that? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. Uh, okay, the question is basically, is defects due to the structure of space-time itself, like uh, specific anomalies in discrete structure, mm -hmm. or is it due to the fields that propagate? The, the aspect of the propagation that we don't know about, and that's merely a mathematical no, a, tool? a defect is just a modification of the field theory that you, you put in your Lagrange. It's, an, it's a local modification of your field theory. So you can use it to mimic uh, some dynamical phenomena that, are, that involve some very heavy degrees of freedom, or you can just use it as a computational tool, as an idealization. Another question? If not, then let's uh, thank uh, Davide again. Stop. It was one. Sorry, there's another one. Uh, you mentioned that you, uh, that, uh, you may study also um, uh, renormalization of the surface operators in asymptotically free theories. Uh, it is uh, your forthcoming work. Uh, what happens in the asymptotically free case? Uh, actually, yeah, I'd, I'd be curious to know what happens to a surface defect in a, in a symptotically free theory, but I have no idea. Uh, now, what I, in this upcoming work, I'm, I'm looking at something like the sub theory, say, which in the UV is a non-abelian asymptotically free description, but in the IR has a, an IR-free abelian description. But you may imagine varying the coupling in space so that on the left, you are justified in using the non-abelian UV description for the theory. And on the right, you're, you had to use the abelian infrared description. You might ask, what do you see in the middle? Uh, this would be a, a sort of RG domain world which might emerge from the work with uh, the most of them. 